next week is a, I felt this about, I don't know, it's probably about a month ago. I really felt we needed to have a day to just worship the Lord a Sunday morning and just go for it. You know, come and really wear your worship gear. I don't even know what that means, but wear your worship gear. Come ready. And, uh, and we want to we want to do some prophetic ministry next week, not only about individuals, but the church also, prophesying over the church. And we want to end with uh, something I really felt was, and we'll, we're figuring out the details on this, to anoint everyone with oil. It'd be like a little rub on the head, drop on the head kind of a thing. Uh, and because uh, we feel it's a time of, of recommissioning into 2021. So be sure to come, bring other people with you, uh, bring visitors, people that are really walking in dread or fear or difficulty. I mean, this, this, is a, this is a sanctuary, this place. It's a sanctuary of hope, and it breaks things off of people. That has been prophesied over us for years, and it's true. So bring friends, let them come. We're going to have a great time. Uh, you know, there'd be no official speaking. I'm sure there'll be some things said or whatever, but we're just going to go with the flow, see what God does and come ready, we'll probably take up our offering at the beginning and get right into it and just worship the Lord. So 2021 is going to be an amazing year. I'm very excited about it. I was excited about 20, 2020. And, and it was for two months, we had a great time. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you that something, you know, I came out of 2020 with, with a new heart. I mean, I had a birth defect. I had to have surgery a year ago. In fact, a year ago this Christmas, I was in, I was in the hospital. And so when I came here in mid-January, I was still healing, you know, my scar, this open heart surgery. Uh, they, they patched the uh, aorta, did some work on my heart that it was needed apparently for a long time. Honestly, I've been feeling better this year than I felt in a long time. Obviously, it was my heart, you know. And uh, so I, I puttered through the uh, pandemic pretty good in that I even got COVID, you know, but in the middle of it, I just thought this is way better than being in the hospital. This is way better than than difficulties and challenges at at maximum levels, corporately as a nation, but also individually. Everything that we have been going through as a nation and individually, I'm telling you, is an opportunity to be shaped by God in a whole new way. I believe that with all my heart. I I, I don't like it at times, but I really know that this is a moment of shaping. This is what I prophesied a year ago that we were in a hinge moment. We are in a hinge moment right now where doors either open or doors close. And in your life, you have to go through a time of self-inspection. I don't want to call it introspection. It's a negative word in our culture. But you need to look at, at your 2020 and say, oh, what happened there? What was I doing in the midst of this? How has my soul been recalibrated? How have I been changed? It's important to look back at prophetic words. I love what Graham Cook says. I can never remember it exactly, but he, he says, he says, he basically talks about how prophetic words will save you in the midst of difficult situations. What God has spoken over you becomes so important in the midst of difficult times. The scripture that God gave you, the, the encouragement someone gave you, the prophetic word that God gave you. And in 2020, I was, I was directed and led by two or three different things, all related together. Number one, the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit, His guidance, power, through the most difficult moments, though we walk through a valley of a shadow of death. And indeed, 2020 was a valley of shadow of death. I will fear no evil because you are with me. The presence of Emmanuel, God with us. That blows everything out of the water. The prophetic words that he spoke over my life, I review them during times of withdrawal, times of limitation, whether you're in a hospital bed or you're alone in a room at home or your husband just left you or you lost your job, whatever it is. In those moments, you recall, you remember, you look back. It's interesting because in Scripture, in some ways, we're called not to look back. You know, Philippians 3 says that. You know, that, that laying aside those things of the past, we press on to the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe there's appropriate times like that where you say, it's not good to remember. You know, let's just put that aside for a while. Because it takes time for you to reformat what has actually happened to you 
and how it's beneficial to where you're going. I mean, we had, we had seven key employees leave in a six-week period right in the middle of COVID this past year. Now, that may not have meant a lot to you. I don't know, depending on how close you were, how well you knew them or whatever. For me, it was a, it was a difficult time. It was difficult walking through that, you know, and I had to kind of have it out with the Lord, you know. I had a few moments where I was, I was miffed. Is that a word now? Do we use that word? Miffed? I know you use other words, but I'm talking about in church words. <laughs> miffed. So in my mythic, mythification, <laughs> my mythification, I was having it out with the Lord, like, Lord, what was that? I mean, we got COVID. Is that not enough to deal with? We got an election coming up in September, November. Is that not? Let's, let's, we're concerned about that. Lord, why these other, and you know what? It's, it's, the Lord speaks to people and tells them to do things. And sometimes it runs contrary to your world of what your hopes or your dreams were for them, you know? And so you learn to bless. You learn to say, God bless them, man. We release that. But inside, you're miffed. You're miffed because it, life doesn't always happen the way you want it to happen. Does anyone agree with that? Okay, good. Yeah, it's, it's really true. And it took a while in my mythification to come to a point where I, it was one moment I got up and I just had a different view. I thought, this is good. This is good. Cindy always has this little thing she says when we go through times like that. She goes, well, here's the deal. She says, the Lord loves us too. And so whatever is happening for other people, it's good for them. He means it to be good for us also. And when she says that almost every time, it kind of changes my thinking. And you start thinking, you think, is it that simple that you just change your thoughts? Yes. I met with a coach this week. I don't get to do this very often. It was a free gig. I got a coach with somebody who's not necessarily a follower of Jesus, but wow, some pretty amazing insights. And I sat as this person talked to me, and they, they said, well, what are your dreams? What do you want to do? You know, usually I'm doing this with other people. This person's asking me. And I said, well, you know, I'm 64. Well, I don't know why I said that. It was just the awkward moment where you don't know what to say. And she said, what does that have to do with anything? I said, well, you know, I'm just telling you I'm 64. And she says, it's just a thought. Now, what I didn't realize was that was the surface. That was the cutting of the flesh. She was going for a healing of the heart. So there was a lot more surgery yet to be done. For like 90 minutes, there was surgery that needed to be done, you know. So she went, and everything I said, she said, that's just a thought. That's just a thought. I'm like, well, it's not a thought. It's blah, blah, blah. She goes, that is just a thought. Circumstances are hard to change. Thoughts are easy to change. You just start thinking different. You need to get a new understanding of what, what, do you, what are you really saying there. So she dug deep, dug deep, got into the heart. There was a whole bunch of stuff that needed to be dealt with, you know. And it got out the, end, uh, the other end of it. It was like everything I started thinking, I realized, well, that's really just a thought. I mean, 2020 held us up. That's just a thought. Maybe 2020 actually advanced you. Well, how is that possible? It's possible because the Word of God says it. And so I want to show a few scriptures here because there's a wind right now of the Spirit that I believe is behind us. Now, headwinds culturally are interpreted as a negative thing. If you've got a headwind, it means you're, you're being held up, right? Headwinds are especially aviation. If you get a headwind in an airplane that you're on, it's not, a good, it's not good news. I remember I was on a flight to Australia once. Jerry, you know what it takes to get to Australia. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare getting there. Hey, I forgot to commission our Marine here. Stand up, Kate. I just realized that. Kate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a launch. Kate has been a part of our church for a while, our youth group. She joined the Marines. She's leaving. When, when are you leaving? The fourth. I thought if we could just pray for her a minute, just stretch out your hand toward her. Lord, we bless this in the name of Jesus, Lord. This, this mission, this shift, this decision, 
Lord, that it's not anything she will ever regret. In fact, Lord, she's realizing, not only for her country, for her personally, but Lord, she's been commissioned by you for some purpose of her development. And we bless her right now, Lord. We thank you for her life, her service into this church, all the things that she's done behind the scenes to help all of us that are here. Lord, we just bless that. Lord, and I think we know that we, we know that boot camp is, is, a, is boot camp, Lord. So I pray, Lord, for strength. I pray, Lord, for might to be upon her. I pray she will excel in everything she does, Lord. And we bless her and send her from this church with all the joy and the peace and the love that we can muster in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank the Lord for Kate. Woo. Dun, 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 dun. No, anyway. All right, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. First Timothy 1, verse 18. Verse 18 says this, Paul writing to his spiritual son, Timothy. There's a little grouping of scriptures here that are very important to catch this one moment before you leave today as we're on this hinge Sunday. I mean, for Kate, big things are coming. This is a hinge time for her. This either opens doors or it closes doors. A lot of it has to do with your thinking. A lot of it has to do with your perception, how you look at a situation. You can look at 2020 as a wasted year, or you can look at 2020 as a year of being confined for a purpose. You can put whatever title you want on that. Christopher Milo, you could say, I was out of work. It was difficult. It was challenging. You can say, the Lord gave me fresh ideas and fresh insights that's going to reach the youth across not only Ohio, but across America and even into the nations of the world. That's the word of the Lord. So what happens is when you release courage, when you release the prophetic, as it says in Romans, that I'll probably be reading in a minute, that you're speaking those things which are not. In other words, they're not, they're not evident, they're not... They're not circumstantial. In fact, they can even be cross-grained to circumstances. Ask Abraham, the father of our faith. Abraham was told that he would, he would bring forth a nation like the sands of the seashore, the stars of the sky. Trouble is, he was 100 years old. How many of you know that's a miracle? It's like, oh, I'm, we, we do not have any children. Uh, I'm 100 years old. The greater miracle is my wife is 99. We're going to bear children. We're going to bring forth a nation. So somewhere you have to get your thinking in alignment with what God speaks. And I love when God speaks things that are way out of your personal understanding or anticipation. He loves to stretch us. He loves to give you little glimpses of who you are and where he wants to take you. He's got a scheme for you. He's got a design for you. Do you know the devil has a scheme for you? And the Bible says that we need to be aware of his schemes or be not ignorant of his schemes. So there's the devil plan, there's the God plan, and there's your plan. I give recommendations to you today. Take your plan, what we call traditionally and culturally, your bucket list, your dreams. Take them and give them to the Lord. His dream is better than your dream. Make the great exchange of heaven. But the devil has a dream for you also. He will be default positions trying to pull you over to that side all the time. This is a better way. Eat from this tree, don't eat from that tree. Go ahead and have relations with a woman to try to bring forth a song, son. That woman is Hagar, and your son will be Ishmael, rather than holding out to the promise of God, which is Isaac. How many people will trade their inheritance for a bowl of soup the way Esau did? How many times we are drawn to the path of evil, and evil doesn't always look evil. In fact, evil can even look like love. Think about that for a moment. But I love that person. That person is married. I know, but this is kind of a unique thing. It's unique in the kingdom. It doesn't happen. You need to back off. Yeah, but I feel it so strong. That is not the Holy Spirit. How can you say that? You're being judgmental. I'm speaking the word of God. I don't think I like you anymore. I'm going to go to another church that agrees with me. The doors are right there. We provide six of them in the back. 
You can leave here, but you can't leave God. If you're a born-again believer, you're following after God, you are losing the sense of the presence of God every day. You go deeper into known sin and sinful territory that you know is contrary to the word of the Lord and the words that have been spoken over your life. You better stay away from the ocean because there's whales out there, big fish, and prophets get swallowed up by it. And the Lord has a way of delivering them back to where they need to be. You may be a prodigal and you're in a pigsty and it's terrible. I got news for you. The Father is still waiting for you. He didn't leave. You did. Go back home. That's what I love about God. The door to come back home is always open. But we wander off. We wander off. Why do we wander off? We do not attend to the true destiny of what God has spoken over our lives. We forget about it. I do. I forget about it. I have to be reminded all the time. That's why I put prophetic words that I've, that I've received, I, I put them on my phones. One, one of the things I've got is like 90 minutes of recordings of probably, I don't know, two dozen prophetic words from the past 40 years. Originals from the people that spoke them. You know, I used to carry a little, little cassette player around with me, you know, before we had smartphones. When I went to a prophetic conference, I was ready. I had my weapon with me, you know. I'd push that little record button and, and just walk around. Do you have a word? Do you have a word? Do you have a word? Amazing words. I listen to it now, and it it's as powerful as it was 30 years ago. What's it do? It puts courage into you. Something happens when you go through a 2020, and the Lord can drop one little word in you, like we're going to be doing next week. Drop one little word in you that can spark you deep inside and get you to go on a path that you never thought that you could go on. Courage. It's putting encouragement is putting courage into somebody else. What a powerful tool it is. Could you imagine in a church like this if people actually practice that? We try to. We raise up hundreds of people that are prophetic, you know, to, to just go around and encourage people. Put courage in them. Stir them up. When you get a word like that, a word like that can carry you through every situation you face, and it causes you to begin to look at things with a different understanding. So on that trip that I was on my way to Australia, and I'm getting the first Timothy here in just a moment, my father was with me. We had a headwind. Normally, it's 12, 13-hour flight out of L.A. Uh, to Sydney. But we were really, I mean, we were out like eight hours, and, and I could tell that from the little picture of the plane on the screen that we weren't in it halfway yet. My father leaned over, and he said, he says, when are we going to get there? I mean, we're eight hours in the plane. I said, it's going to be another seven or eight hours. He's like, What? That's impossible. That's not true. I said, no, it's going to be another seven or eight hours. He said, we've already been flying eight hours. Dad, I said, Dad, it's a big world. It's a really big world. <laughs> he said, that's crazy. He said, called over stewards and said, how long is it going to be before we get there? And she said, well, sir, we have a strong headwind. It's going to be another nine or ten hours. I just looked at him like, my version was better. You should have listened to it. He said, I can tell you one thing, this is a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and it was for him. He never, he never went back to Australia after that. He loved Australia. Just getting there is the challenge, you know. And so what was a normal 12-hour trip took over 19 hours. In fact, we started to run out of fuel, and they had to land in Brisbane, short of Sydney, refuel to fly another half hour or so down to Sydney. I mean, we were, we were flying on fumes. And so that's a headwind. A headwind pushes against you. But here, you know, the birds in Florida that I love, these, I don't know, these little birds, a little tuft on their head, black mask and everything, they all hang out together on the beach. I don't blame them. I think it's a great idea. That's God's plan, really. So they're on the beach, hundreds of them, you know, and they all face. When you walk through them, they'll make, you know, they get out of your way, but they turn, they all face the exact same direction toward the wind. Because they understand. See, for us, a headwind is delay. For us, a headwind is, is something we don't want. For us, is, a headwind is a great inconvenience. For these little birds on the beach, a headwind is an easy escape. They spread their wings and poof, they're gone. The headwind causes lift and lifts them right up out of it. And so if they feel something threatening, if you make a threatening move toward them, boom, they're right up. They're up there. So what's happening is, is that we've got to reinterpret this headwind. It's holding me back. And the headwind is coming to lift you up into a whole new place. You got to see that, though. It's your thoughts. 
It's like that coach I had this week. It was, everything was like, that's your, just a thought. That's your thought. You need to change your thoughts. I mean, by the time I got out of there, about every thought I had, I needed to change. I need to re-understand what is being said to me. It's very similar to the prophetic. It's very similar. The prophetic is put into your mind in order for your thoughts to be customized and shaped into the direction that God has for you. Even if it's something that is outside your normal understanding of what God might want to do. So back to uh, Timothy here. I'd like to read scripture here before I finish. 1 Timothy verse one, chapter 1, verse 18 says this. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them, everyone say by them, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So what I do is I collect these prophetic words. I don't just use them as they're not little badges on a sash that I wear around town. These are, these, are, these are proton pills. They're, they're explosive. They're powerful. They're, they're there as weaponry for the warfare that I face when I feel that things are coming against me. I can fight that with the word of the Lord, scripture, and prophetic words that God has been speaking over my life. And so Paul tells Timothy, he said, this is kind of important that you remember these words that were given to you previously. As a church, uh, we remembered, in fact, in the year 2000, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a couple weeks, but this, we created this book, our church here, in the year 2000. Uh, and it's a, it's kind of a, it's a compilation of numerous prophetic words over this city up until that point. So that was only, you know, it was a, probably 20, 30 years of things that we gathered together from, I think about 1985 or 86 up to 2000. And uh, we just talk a little bit, we interpret some of those things, lay out a, you know, what the destiny for Cleveland is. In fact, we have one page here where, which I'll share in a couple of weeks, but it, it clearly lays out through Graham Cook word that came in 1998 called the City of God's Dreams that pastors all over the city have copies of. I mean, I've actually been in pastor's meetings where they go, hey, have you seen this word by a guy named Graham Cook? And I go, yeah, it was at our church when he said it, you know. But he gave this powerful meta-narrative over the city that involves about 12 different things that are going to happen to the city. And here we are now 20 years later. So why do I have this little book? By the way, we're down to like five copies of this. So I'm, I'm thinking about reprinting it and updating it because it's a, it's an, it's, it was meant to be a prophetic intercessory guide to Cleveland. Why we have faith in Cleveland. Why we're here. It's not because of the weather. I know some of you love it, but it's not because of the weather. It's not because of the beauty of the city, although this, the city has great beauty to it. It's not just because of the food that's in this city. We are here, obviously some of us are born here, some of us moved here, whatever. We are here because we are holding on to something that is beyond ourselves. Those words that were previously given, we are using to fight a good warfare to see a city transformed in the name of Jesus. Now a lot of people ask me, what does that city look like? I'll tell you in a couple of weeks, on the 10th. What does the city look like? What, what is the dream that God wants to raise up in this city this, what, the, what Graham Cook called the city of God's dreams, where the church of God's dreams emerges. Now, it's not just one church. Church, as we know, is universal and broad. But there is a church that is going to emerge in the city with multiple titles that will be a powerful church that it rules from a heavenly place rather than from an earthly place. Here's the deal. I want to be a part of that church. I want to be a part of the church that holds the, the truthful circumstances in one hand, but on the other hand, holds on to an understanding that I understand this is where we are, but this is what God has spoken. And I'm choosing to base my actions off of what, and my thoughts on what God has spoken rather than the reality that I see around me. Do you understand that is the biblical template for faith in every situation? 
Am I going to go with the fact that the Red Sea is in front of me and the most mighty army in the world is coming after me? I can see the dust in the desert from their chariots. They're coming after me. I've got a million complaining people here that have just been delivered out of Egypt and we're up against the Red Sea and now everything that I've said up to this point looks foolish. I led them out here in the wilderness just to die in the wilderness because we escaped Egypt. Little did they know that he had the answer in his hand. It was his staff. And when he stretches his staff out toward the water, puts the staff first. That's what I'm going to do, Jerry. You put our staff first. The staff first out over the waters that the waters parted and opened a door where there was no door. Some of you have read articles on this. This was not the Reed Sea where the, the waters were out at a certain time of the year and you could slush across it. No, the Bible says that the, the ground was dry. And the waters were held up on each side. And the very sea that delivered them when they got through on the other side, it collapsed on top of the enemy's horse and rider thrown into the sea. That's what Miriam danced and celebrated, that the enemies had been crushed. And in the New Testament sense, that is a picture of baptism. So you look at all this and you say, but my circuit, it does not matter what your circumstances are. It matters what God has spoken over your life and what he will take you through in that moment. And so in these times, you've got to say, that is just a thought. I remove that thought. I pull in something that is God thought. What does God say? What does God, I mean, I had, a, I had two powerful prophetic words earlier in this year. Uh, one was by Chris Valentin, another one from Shara uh, Chambers, uh, Pratham Chamber, uh, Chambers. And uh, they were both powerful. They were both on the ninth of the month. One was in uh, uh, February, one was in April. And, and they were, two, you know, they, were discon- they weren't connected words in the sense that they had no way of sharing this, but... Uh, several of the, the words had very similar, I mapped them out on my wall and they said very similar things that, that you haven't seen anything yet. That was over me. And I thought, well, I've seen a lot, you know, but it's like, that's just a thought. If you haven't seen anything yet, it means there's things that are in our future that we have not seen yet. Well, I've seen a lot of things. I know, but there's things in your future. Well, that's part of the Toronto blessing. You bl- there's things in your future that are things you've never seen before. In fact, one of them said that there's, there's a mantle in your chest, forgetting, not knowing that I just had heart surgery. He said, there's a mantle in your chest, and it said, he said, pull it out, put it on. And it talked about the nations and everything else. And some of these words were kind of mixed with words I've already had. It was like affirmation. And the Lord will do that. He'll give you words you've already heard. And then he throws a few others in there to let you know that these others help substantiate what you're hearing right now. It's kind of like he shows you his business card. Do we do that anymore? I don't know. <laughs> you go on LinkedIn or something. I don't know. But uh, you show his business card saying, look, this is me. In fact, this is me. I'll tell you this, this, and this so that you'll know it's me. And you're like, okay, that's the Lord. And all of a sudden, he throws something in there like, what what was that? I mean, I had a word this year, one of those two words, where they said, "Your, your humor will heal the mentally ill. I said, Lord, could you tell that to my wife? She doesn't always get my humor, you know, so... This, this, is, this is therapy, Cindy. His humor helps people. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, that's an odd word. And, and for a moment, I almost spun it off thinking, okay, well, these words are, yeah, powerful. Woo! Really falls into the words I know. But this one over here is like, well, Lord, yeah, but I want to add that in there. And then he had a few others that I won't tell you, but a few others that he added in there, and I'm like, oh, these are outliers right here. So now I'm going to have to incorporate those in and begin to believe that that is God because it came with a company of words that were confirmed that that's the word of the Lord. That's what Timothy's going through, and the Lord, through Paul, is taking him to a point. We'll get to this in a couple weeks. It says this, that according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. That's a war that you win. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4, just got a few minutes left. In fact, I'm over, so let me uh, hurry along here. 1 Timothy 4, 
Verse 14 says this, Do not neglect, Timothy, the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy. Isn't that interesting? You can impart gifts through prophecy. Through prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Verse 15, he says this, Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. So see, these words, I know a lot of Christians just kind of collect prophetic words. Those words are not meant to be put away in a box somewhere. Those, those words are tools and weapons for your future. And with what we've been through this year, you, know, you can't believe how many times I've, I've listened to some of the prophetic words in my past this year, 2020. Because this is a year you need to remind yourself, God is in control. God is going to do great things. God knows that the person you voted for either won or didn't win. God's going to somehow arrange the future out of this. God's somehow going to cause America to survive. I mean, the, the, the only thing that gives me peace is when I know that God has already spoken into my future and it does not involve calamity. That gives you a different perspective, doesn't it? The person with hope, Bill Johnson says, has the greatest influence. So you walk with hope. You walk with understanding why. You are believing beyond the circumstances. The things that are happening around you are not going to dictate what you do. You're already beyond that, living in your future. You're living future present rather than past present. I look at the past to get indicators about my future, to hear the words that God gave, but I turn around and I am pressing toward a that's pressing speaks of a headwind. I'm pressing toward the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1, last one. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6 and 7. Paul says it again. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Interesting. In this case, he says, you're responsible. Stir up the gift that was given to you. So this is a moment in this hinge moment at the end of the year where we say, you know, you're, you're crying out, Lord God, bring 2021. Let 2021 be so much better than 2020, Lord. Those are not bad prayers. Let me give you a better one. Lord, all that has been spoken over my life, I stir up in the name of Jesus. Lord, for our church, for our city, for our nation, for my life, Lord God, we stir, these are good prayers right now. We stir it up in this hinge moment as we get ready to go toward 2021. I pray, Lord God, stir up the gifts of God that they will, they will not be sidetracked. I will not miss a beat in this thing. In fact, any re, a confinement that I've had this year or restriction upon me, I believe, Lord, that much more. Everything that's been robbed of me, I'm gonna return seven times in 2021. I'm gonna come blasting out of the chute in the the first quarter of 2021. What about social distancing and restrictions and masks? I know. Somehow, though, we're going to blast all through. Those are circumstances around us, but it will not hold up the Word of God or the purpose of God. For my life, I'm leaning into it. I'm believing, Lord God. The same thing that's going to hold others back is going to lift me up to higher places in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together if we could. Jay or somebody's going to come up. I don't know who, who's up here. Jerry. I just want to take a moment. This week is meant to be a week of faith. It's meant to be a week of looking back. I, I do it every year, and I think culturally we naturally do it. Look back over this past year. Retitle some of those things that happened to you. Reframe those things that have been in your life. Reframe them with your knowledge of what has been spoken over your life as as impossible as it might seem. Some of those words given to me in February and April are impossible words. <laughs> They're impossible words. I mean, Chris Valentin had a word. He said it publicly. That's why I feel free sharing it. That we would be in circumstances where it rains inside the building. The glory of God. You said, that's impossible. I, I know. That's what I thought. I know. He said, supernatural miracles and signs will come like 
rain in a building. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's, that's a good sign. You can't make that happen, really. So let's see what God's going to do. So that's an impossible that you've got to pull in on these. There are words over your life that indeed are not fully prophetic words if it's not going to involve you having faith to see those accomplished. You have to begin to believe first. It says about Abraham that he did not look to his own body. In fact, it said it did look. He looked at his own body and saw it. The Bible says, as good as dead. I feel that some days. Look at your own body and go, huh, that's not good. It's not a whole lot of time waiting on this clock, you know. But he looked at that. Yet he believed at 100 years old. You say, is that kind of faith possible? Yes. You are sons and daughters of Abraham. I just prophesy it right now. We're going to do more next week and a week after. But we just prophesy right now. I, uh, my goal over these three Sundays, this Sunday, next Sunday, and the following Sunday, is to charge us. We, this is the battery charge for 2021. I pray, Lord, for a charging, for a little spark of something in every heart here right now that says, I, I, I'm ready for this. I'm ready to run. I'm ready to do something powerful. Cindy got me a new Apple Watch this week, you know, and I'm joining, I'm playing with, trying to figure it all out and everything, and it traces everything about my life, you know. It and Google, they track my life. And I, uh, I got a distressful email this week, like one that's like, oh. And I was, in my, I was in my car, and I just read this email. I was sitting at a restaurant parking lot. And I was, it immediately sent me into the distress, you know. I was like, oh, oh. And in the midst of it, I heard, it was my Apple Watch. I looked at it, and it said, breathe. I thought, Whew. I didn't know whether to thank the Holy Spirit or thank Stephen Jobs in that moment. I was like, thank you, Lord. Lord, that's, that's like your spirit, Lord. Breathe. And it shows like wind moving around when it tells you. I'm like, Jesus, this is the word for you right now. Breathe. Just kind of breathe. Breathe in the breath of God right now, Jerry. 